Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for ethics, excuse me, engineering ethics, are you in jeopardy? This is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center, and I'm so pleased to have with us my colleague, Ted Green, who is a professional engineer, not only in the state of New Jersey, where he works for the LTAP Center, but in New York, Pennsylvania, and that's Massachusetts, right, Ted? That's and correct. I, there we go. So I'm gonna do a couple quick housekeeping items, and then I'll turn things over to Ted. First off, I'd like for everybody to look for the question box on your GoToWebinar panel. And if you wouldn't mind, please put a hi or hello in there so I know you found it, because this is gonna be really important for later on when we get to the Jeopardy portion of the webinar. I see lots of highs and hellos coming in now, that's great. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you know is in the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel, we have for you um, a couple of handouts that Ted has provided. One of them is, is the NSPE Code of Ethics for Engineers, and the other one is the ASCE Code of Ethics. So those two items are available for download. If by some chance though your computer is not cooperating, I'll be emailing those out afterwards as well. The other things I've put in there are just items that you might be interested in. Um, they are announcements about upcoming webinars. We have one um for ada and temporary traffic control that's going to be done by ron eck and we also have a self-evaluations um, and transition plans and proag overview that's going to be done by ron eck we have in addition to that a gravel roads design and maintenance webinar series that can comprise the entire course um, and that one's going to be offered by bruce drews so if you're interested, we've got those for you. There's no charge to participate. So I think that's all I had, Ted. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. All right, there you go. Thank you very much, Victoria. Might as well go camera view uh, if it works. Eh, maybe it doesn't work. There it goes. Uh, that's I'd like to welcome everybody to Engineering Ethics. Uh, you are, are you in jeopardy? This is always a big concern with many engineers uh, out there, especially when there is the requirement that we have to have continuing education requirements for our license renewal for this. And that's many states throughout the country right now on it. I think that actually started here in New Jersey as well. As Victoria said, my name is uh, Ted Green. I am a licensed professional engineer in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. <clears throat> I used to be, uh, I'm an immediate past region governor of the American Society of Civil Engineers, and I used to be chair of two of the national committees, and one of them was on the professional practice side as well. Uh, so we're gonna be going through this uh, presentation. Hopefully we all have some good fun. This is the first time I've ever done this in a virtual format, so I hope it works well. It, sometimes it does get pretty, uh, uh, hot and competitive during the in set live in session groups as well so hopefully uh, we get some of that in uh, excitement as well of uh, that i'm going to quickly run through a couple parts of this uh, before we actually get to the jeopardy game as well uh, just acknowledgements this uh, most of this presentation was prepared by tara hoke who's the general counsel at the american society of engineers as well as andrew hunt PE as well. So they had a lot to do with this presentation on that. <clears throat> so the big question is becomes ethics. And I've had this come up and other people who have taught ethics classes have get the questions, how can you teach ethics if you're not an attorney? The big question is who says you have to have an attorney talking about ethics? Because attorneys are looking into the legal, the law part of things overall. Well, following the law and obeying the law is something that we have to do. However, Ethics isn't about following the laws. It's about what is considered what uh, is considered morally or ethically correct. So it's the things that we ought to do, but not necessarily have to do. So they are two very different uh, types of items on that. So three different types of levels when it comes to ethical behavior. One is everybody has their personal behavior. The other is what does society expect of us as an engineer, what is expected from them, and what are other social behaviors that are expected as well on oh, that. So it's not always so cut and dry as what the law says. Sometimes we get into the very gray areas, and those are the areas that we have to worry about in many cases. <clears throat> 
So there are many different definitions of ethics. Each dictionary will have a slightly different version of it. This one is from the Cambridge Dictionary and it has these two def, uh, definitions. It's a system of accepted beliefs that control behavior and a study of what is morally right and what is not. So as you see, it's not about the legal aspects on it. We get into the morals, what are the societies, what's it, what is it expecting from us? So what's ethical behavior? Well, one is simply as uh, some people think it's simply as doing on to uh, doing on to others as you would have others do on to you. The thing is, it's not really something that we can go on because what somebody might think is acceptable behavior overall, others may not be considered acceptable behavior as well. So we always have those little challenges out there uh, overall becomes a bigger issue for people who work internationally as well, because what might be a, a considered an accepted custom in some parts of the uh, world may be considered actually illegal in this country as well, because it might be considered bribery. Uh, that. So we get into those little tricky areas as well. Uh, unfortunately, real life situations uh, are a little bit different. We know, and the thing is, we never know when we're going to get into an ethical situation until we actually step into an ethical situation overall. So it's not quite so simple overall with that. So we're going to be using this whole pro, uh, program is going to be based on two National Society's Code of Ethics, and they're very similar. American Society of Civil Engineers, their code of ethics, which is put into three parts, and I'll be using their current code of uh, conduct and ethics as well. They are in the process of revising it and will most likely be changed come October, but we'll be using the current one. Uh, so they have the basic fundamental principles, the fundamental canons of ethical behavior, and then guidelines for practice under the fundamental canons of ethics. National Society of Professional Engineers, or NSPE, their code of ethics is in four parts. They have a preamble, but then they have a fundamental canon, rules of practice, and professional obligations. Both of these societies have very similar uh, code of ethics. Uh, ASCs was revised several years ago because there was a complaint filed with uh, the Commerce Department, uh, and those parts were changed, but those, some of those items still remain in NSPEs. Code of Ethics, and ASE has added additional things along the way in the past few years as well. <clears throat> so these are the uh, fundamental codes of canons for both of the societies. Let's start with fundamental canon number one. With ASCE, it says, engineers shall hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public and shall strive to comply with the principles of sustainable development and the performance of their professional duties. So this is considered the most important item out there. Similarly, NSPE has engineers and the fulfillment of their professional duty shall hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Uh, so people are aware NSPE, they represent all licensed professional engineers while ASCE is limited to civil engineers on it. But still, same language there. Let's go to canon number two. ASCE just says engineers shall perform services only in their area of competence on that. So whatever area you're practicing is where you uh, are going to be practicing. So if a person who's been doing just highway engineers suddenly next day does a bridge design, that might be an issue. Doesn't mean people can't transition from a highway engineer over to a bridge engineer, but it's just you can't make that immediate leap to it without having gone through a formal process on that. NSPE, similar language, perform services only in their area of competence. More so than you don't want a civil engineering perf engineer performing mechanical or electrical engineering work. Canon number three, ASCE says engineers shall issue public statements only in an objective and truthful manner. NSPE issue public statements only in an objective and truthful manner essentially the same on that. Canon number four, engineers shall act in the professional matters for each employer or client as faithful agents or trustees and shall avoid conflicts of interest on that. And that always becomes a big issue on a, what are our conflicts of an, uh, interest. It becomes a bigger issue with many uh, government employees as well because they might have additional requirements within their organization that uh, to help make sure that they know where a conflict comes in so that they can remove themselves from that conflict on that so but a lot of times these conflicts pop up you're not aware of it 
and SPE act for each employee or client as faithful agents or trustees on that. Canon number five, engineers shall build their professional reputation on the merits of their services and shall not compete unfairly with others. Uh, that NSP, their part to it is just to avoid deceptive acts. This unfortunately does become an issue on it. ASCE, a lot of their complaints that they receive with their, as well as NSP, uh, they, they receive for uh, code of ethics violations has to do with in many cases canon number five on that uh, a lot of times it's more i think it's for under canon six where they uh, say things that are not appropriate towards another licensed engineer as well but sometimes some people take credit for other people's work and that's a big one here under canon number five Canon six, engineers shall act in such a matter as to uphold and the, enhance the honor, integrity, and dignity of the engineering profession and shall act with zero tolerance of bribery, fraud, and corruption on that. So those are some strong words in there, especially with honor, integrity, and dignity. NSBE uh, engineers need to conduct themselves honorably, responsibly, ethically, and lawfully so as to enhance the honor, reputation, and usefulness of the profession. So the very important thing is that we also have to look into the honor and integrity. And many of these, we'll get into two more canons here, but many of these canons are actually in most states' department, uh, states licensing boards for the requirements in the oath that you talk to be a licensed professional engineer as well. Canon number seven, this one is specific to ASCE. Uh, engineers shall continue their professional development through their careers and shall provide opportunities for professional development of those engineers under their supervision. We're all here taking this class because of professional uh, professional development requirements that our states provide, and we will go we go through those particular items as well. And we have people on this webinar from all over the country, West Coast, uh, even into Puerto Rico. So we all have our various requirements that we have in there. So we have to make sure that we are following these requirements overall for professional development. But just importantly. If you are a supervisor, make sure you provide those opportunities for the people that work below you so that they have the ability to get the knowledge and move upwards in the professions. Canon number eight, also very specific to ASCE, it says engineers shall in all matters related to their profession treat all persons fairly and encourage equitable participation without regard for gender or gender identity, race, national origin, ethnicity, religion, age, sexual orientation, disability, political affiliation, or family, marital, or economic status. So that's when they added a few years ago to the canons on that. So let's talk about a quick thing on ethics policies. All agencies and private co uh, companies really do need to have their own policies on it and about their policies. The best ones are overall self-enforcing. They are transparent. They're flexible, and ultimately, though, if something goes wrong and somebody violates these policies, is there an accountability to it? So you always need to have, uh, you know, good to provide praise if somebody's doing it correctly. Also, make sure that there's accountability if something is not done as well on that. So these are the basic requirements of every ethics policy. Private agencies, private companies will have different ones than a uh, government agency. Government agency usually has their internal policies as well as state their state laws that might limit them on certain things some things may be acceptable in the private sector they're not considered acceptable in the public sector uh, this is uh, a flow chart that i got from the institution of civil engineers there in the uh, united kingdom there's similar uh, they're actually a licensing, one of the licensing bodies in the United Kingdom on that. Uh, they're over 200 years old as well. Uh, that, but this just shows you a flow chart of what they considered acceptable items overall for uh, ethics. The main one is if you go up to here, is start at the top, are your actions legal? If they're not legal, you're not even in the ethics realm. You're just in the legal issues on it. So see what your uh, obligations are, making sure there's nothing that makes it illegal. Then at that point, look at those coded conducts. Uh, it may not just be ASCE or NSPEs or several other uh, 
groups out there, whether it's ASHI or others as well, or even your own internal policies, do they satisfy your internal satisfy your professional con codes of conduct as well? Well, if it does, then go, how about all your stakeholders? Especially projects like, like a building project, there might be several stakeholders that are involved. Do you have anything that might be considered an issue for any of them or any kind of conflicts, which gets into the next item, are there any conflicts of interest on that? If you say no, the ultimate litmus test is this. How will your actions be perceived by the public on that? So a lot of people call it the optics test, but uh, how, it, how will it be if you go through this process, how will the public perceive it on that? So that becomes the big item overall with that. So, so things always to consider when you go through this. Oh, went through that quick. Uh, so we've got a good amount of time uh, for the engineering ethics in their Jeopardy format. I'm not expecting to actually complete uh, the Jeopardy, just like in the real show, uh, that they don't always uh, finish this as well. I need to get back to my pointer. Uh, so let's get into the group game rules. We will be using the Jeopardy format. We will be using the chat boxes. So just like in the actual show, I will read the question that's in its entirety. After we read, I read the question, the first person that responds in the chat box with any two or more letter word will be permitted to answer the chat, the question in the, or provide the question in the chat box as well. An actual word, you know, like, O is, you know, OH is fine or me is fine. Uh, if it's like XZ, no, that is not a word on that. So, or just hitting whatever uh, keys come up first on the keyboard won't count for that. <clears throat> Ted, just a quick reminder that it's um, the question box for us. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, it'll be in your question box. Sorry. That's oh, sorry. All right. Thanks. I forgot you. I forgot I have the chat box. You don't. Uh, so, in the question and answer box you have in the corner. So, uh, I will then show the answer of that that's on the screen. And then the person that responded initially that will be able to choose the next topic and value number as well of that. Um, and then this will be self scoring of that. So, you can always, uh, if you're not uh, actively playing, you can always see how well you did with yourself as well as we go through this process. On that. So let's get started with our game. This is the game board that we have out there. Uh, that Victoria, actually, I give you the honors. Do you want to pick a category and uh, value number? Let's start with to report or not to report for 300, Ted. Okay. Now I definitely got to get my mouse back, but I got to get something to come back. Come on back. Okay, give me my arrow. You're fine. I'd blame it on the storm brewing over my house right now, but I know it's not going on in New Jersey too, so. Yep. There we go. Okay, to report or not report for 300. Here's the question. And remember, I have to wait till I get to the last word, then you can pop it into the box. Employer pressures staff to donate to a political campaigns for incumbent state decision makers. Staff do not that do not do so or reward staff that do so are rewarded by bonuses, promotions, and other benefits. Ultimately, report or not to All report. Right. I found the first person that put it in after you got to the last word, and that would be Brian Gresser, and he put what is false. You want it in the Jeopardy format too. Oh, what? yeah. And the bigger question is, what is to report or not to report all oh, that? So, so that wasn't quite correct on that. All right. Does he still get to pick then? Uh, let's go through the answer. Yeah, he'll still get to pick. Let's go through the answer on it. The answer, what, and when we get into the report or don't or not report, uh, ultimately, the answer is going to become to whatever canon you're using. ASCE has a couple canons. One is Canon number four it says engineers shall act in a professional matter for each employer or client as faithful agents or trustees. So, lukewarm on the idea of providing uh, 
campaigns on that. Engineers shall not give, solicit, or receive other, either directly or indirectly, any political contributions, gratuity, or unlawful consideration in order to secure work exclusively of securing salaried positions through, uh, through employment agencies. ASC. So that one's where we get into that. If you're providing the direct campaign money, looking for money, but of course, some people in this case, people that were doing it for the company were getting doing well. Uh, of course, engineers should not promote their own interests at the expense of the dignity of in uh, and integrity of the profession. On it, so they always get into that last thing. What will the how will it be perceived? The optics of it. So this always have that perception of optics on it. I've actually worked for a company where they did for the higher ups have this almost as a requirement as well. And now it did not go well, especially when it hit the press on that. So, uh, so basically in this case, you know, many people get into the debate whether they should report it or not on it. It's basically when it comes to some of these matters, uh, some states might require the reporting. The, these various professional societies do require the reporting if the uh, people involved are members of those individual societies on that. So that's question number one. So we can have a choice for the next okay. one. So. You'll have to put what he'd like in the question box. And if the person who responds first doesn't have a question, the answer in the form of a question, I'll be asking them for that. Okay. It just happened that he did. So, all right. Brian, you got to tell us where you want to go next. Hopefully you're still there. True for 100, he said. True or false for 100. True or false, engineers do not have to make ethical obligations to seek licensure or continuing education. We have Sean Milroy, who Sean. was the first one to respond. And he said, what is false? And that is correct, all that. We saw earlier uh, with the various canons, uh, more so ASEs than uh, NSPs. Uh, just so you know, the full text of these are in those handouts that you had from both of the societies on it. But I showed it earlier was just the, the highlight text of it. Engineers should, uh, should keep current in their specialty fields by engaging in professional practice, participating in continuing education courses, reading and tech, uh, the technical literature, and attending professional meetings and seminars. Engineers should encourage uh, their engineering employees to become registered at or licensed at the earliest possible date as well. Similarly, NSPE engineers shall continue their professional development throughout their careers and shall keep current in their specialty fields by engaging in the professional practice, participating in continuing education courses, reading in the technical literature, and attending professional meetings and seminars. Hmm, do you think the same person may have written part of these things? Uh, so we see that thing about a part about continuing education. It's an important part, especially if things have changed. I remember when I first started into profession, computers, CAD operated pro, uh, computers were just coming into it. Now it's the norm. Uh, some people remember the days of Mylar and Leroy pins as well. Uh, that, so things have definitely changed uh, overall with that. We don't even use paper much anymore either. So, Okay, tell us where you'd like to go next. Fill in the blank for 500. Fill in the blank for 500. An engineer wishes to make a presentation on a new technology at an ASCE conference or any other conference. A manufacturer of the product relates, related to that particular technology offers to pay for her travel and expenses. The engineer should what? Well, sorry, they started responding pretty quickly in there. I've got um, Alex Merrill. You came up as the first person to respond after Ted put that in. So, Alex, if you'll put your answer, what is decline? Ted? What was that again? They said, what is decline? Okay, that is one of the options. And this is where it gets very interesting on these type of things. Uh, uh, there are two ways to look at it because now we're getting into policies, internal policies overall. We'll go through what these are and have a quick, a very quick uh, mention about it. AAC's canon says engineers shall have issued no statement, criticism, or argu arg arguments 
on engineering matters which are inspired or paid for by interested parties, unless they indicate on whose behalf the statements are made. NSPE engineers shall issue no statements, criticism, or, or arguments on technical matters that are inspired or paid for by an interested party unless they have prefaced their comments by explicitly identifying the interested parties on whose behalf they are speaking. Uh, and that's where it starts getting gray on it. Most people, a lot of people think immediately that they should not uh, speak on it, but what they're talking about here is full disclosure. Uh, that sometimes some people might come across a particular product they like audit and that they might have an involvement with a particular convention or conference overall and as a user of that product they become a speaker uh, talking about the public product but the key part is they have to mention there that being that they're being paid for in a sense they're acting as an extension of them overall then they need to make sure they make those statements very clear that's actually almost a global thing. Even things such as YouTube have these policies. You see a lot of YouTube videos and you see people pushing or talking about certain products. You actually look in, if you ever click the more statement, uh, you know, the description, you go to the more, you'll actually find out they will typically have a statement in there indicating that these products were paid for by the manufacturer for their review and then also do a disclaimer whether or not they will make any changes to what is said on it, whether the company pre-approves the, uh, the reviews on it, and if they've been sent out to an area, especially with car manufacturers and camera manufacturers, they will send people out to big events, uh, and they pay for the, the travel to those events as well. Those have to be made as public as well on YouTube on that. So across the board, the big thing is making sure everybody's aware of any potential conflicts you might have in there. Time to select the next category. Okay, tell us where you'd like for us to go next. Um, still waiting to know. What's wrong with that for 100? What's wrong with that for 100? An engineer's old college friend asks for advice on an engineering matter. Though the engineer is not licensed in the state where the friend lives and the subject is not within the engineer's particular area of expertise, there's no harm in giving a friend simple advice. Andrew, you were the first one on there, Andrew Sufferetz. Sorry if I butchered your last name's pronunciation. Please go ahead and give me the answer. It says, what is only practice in areas that you have experience in? And that this is where suddenly something got very gray in this whole thing. Somebody's asking for advice, but were they practicing? So let's go through the canons on that. Engineers shall not falsely or uh, not falsely or permit misrepresentation of their academic or professional qualifications or experience, or as our respondent said about mis uh, about uh, practicing within their uh, expertise. Engineers shall not uh, falsely falsify their qualifications or permit misrepresentation of their on their of theirs on their or their associates' qualifications. The reason why I say things get gray, and if you looked at how that question was phrased, were they actually providing actual engineering services to a friend? Uh, and there's one attorney says, "I'm not providing you any legal advice. I'm just your new best friend, and I'm just." saying things that's common knowledge out there overall. So he like said, this is where things get gray, and that is the problem with ethics. Uh, there's not necessarily a clear uh, choice between yes and no in many cases. We get into that area in between. A lot of times we get into that, we saw that ethics chart from the Institution of Civil Engineers, go through that list. How does it look at the bottom on it? And were you actually providing advice on that? People have opinions on a lot of things. It all depends on how the context of that advice was done on that. So, but if they're actually providing information and that person uses it without furthering going through the process, getting a licensed professional engineer to go through it, that's when the issues start becoming a big problem on that. <clears throat> Next choice. True or false 200? True or false for 200. True or false, an engineer may never use a client's confidential information for the engineer's own personal benefit. 
Benjamin Kowalski. If you could put the response in to the box. What is true? That is correct, Dada. So on the uh, earlier in the canons, engineers shall not use confidential information coming to them in the course of their assignment as means of making professional profit in such ad actions and uh, is advised in the interest of the clients, employers, or publics, uh, or the public as well, or shall not reveal facts, data, or information without the prior consent of the client or uh, employer except as authorized or required by law or of this code. That's actually an important part of NSPEs when we talk about uh, div uh, divulging information. Where we get into the ethics versus law, uh, we see here authorized or required by law. So if all of a sudden there's a legal matter and there's a subpoena, you will be required to respond to the subpoena on that. So that's where it goes from ethics to legal aspects. But, but for the most part, uh, the answer is it's going to be false on that. If there is no legal requirement for it, then no, it's not something you're supposed to let out. Next question, choice. Okay, let us know what you'd like. You make the call 100, please. You make the call for 100. An engineer is visiting a construction site, observes an unsured trench which could cause serious harm to construction inspection if it collapses. The engineer's contract expressly disclaims responsibility for construction means or job site safety. Engine engineer takes no action to address the issue or give warning. What do you do? What just told me I was muted, sorry. Ryan Athey, I have you down as the first one who responded after Ted finished answering. So you'll have to tell me what you'd like me to read off because all I got was what is. So please go ahead and put your whole answer in the box. What is you report it? What it should be reported. That becomes always the big issue all day. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people are aware, here's just the fundamental can canons, and there's also various state laws out there that affect these things as well. Number one, engineers shall hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. That is the number one item. If you have a uh, excavation out there that has improper shoring on it, there is the basic, there is the ethical requirement to ethical expectation that um, that we uphold the life and safety of the welfare of the public on that as well. Uh, other canons on it, engineers shall recognize that the lives, safety, and health of the welfare of the general public are depending upon engineering judgment decisions and practices incorporated into structures, machines, product, process, and de uh, devices. And of course, engineers in the fulfillment of their professional duties shall will paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. So. Health and safety of the public is an important thing. Now we always get into the legal spot. What do you have to do? Uh, many states have in their uh, requirements for licensed professional engineers is that if a licensed professional engineer sees a, a safety hazard, they need to bring it to the attention of somebody in responsible charge of that project, whether it's a foreman of a project. It doesn't go any further than that. Uh, that doesn't say you have to make sure that they actually do it, but in many cases they say bring it to the attention of the people in it. And if you do bring it to the attention of somebody, make sure you document who you did and when you did it. Uh, so if something does go uh, horribly wrong, unfortunately, uh, it helps protect yourself somewhat by saying that you did your part on that. So. So it's always that's where it gets very tough on that. There have been lawsuits about this in some states. It definitely, I think, it was in uh, Chicago as well. On uh, lawsuits like this, somebody was an inspector. They weren't even they knew nothing about shoring or uh, excavations, and there was unfortunately a fatality when it collapsed. And they tried to lay blame on a recently out of school engineer as well on that. So in that case, there was no expectation for that person to truly understand what. The issues were on that. Uh, question choice. All right. What question would you like read next? I have to put it in the box so I can read it off. True or false for 500? True or false for 500. And we have a daily double. Oh, I actually got to hear that one. 
Oh, so we had a uh, daily double. Ada, here's the question. True or false? Engineers may continue to perform engineering services despite having a conflict of interest as long as they have a consent form from all parties involved. True or false? Mark Flowers, you were the first one to respond on the box. So, and he put in what is false? What is, oh, nice in the form of a question on it. Uh, and for the most part, that is generally the considered uh, uh, acceptable answer, especially when we get into optics. Canons say get a little bit gray in there. It says engineers shall avoid all known or potential conflict of interest with their employers or clients, con clients sorry, and shall pr promptly inform their employers or clients of any business association interests or circumstances which could influence their judgment of the quality of the services on that. Um, engineers shall disclose all known or potential conflict of interest that should influence or appear to influence the judgment of their quality of assurance. Generally, the answer will be false for the situation. Nobody really wants to, even with the permission of other people around, it just doesn't look good on that. Because in the end, who is that person's, uh, who are they going to be protecting if something's not going to go right? Are they going to be protecting the client, the owner of a project, or uh, themselves or the firm that they work for. So we have all those different groups involved with there. So there's, uh, it's pretty hard to separate that out overall with that, even if somebody does give all, gives all the approvals on that. So most people would go with false, of just avoid the conflict, don't be involved. Okay, we Next. need to know which category, true or false for 300. Oh, true or false for 400, I'm sorry. Okay. True or false, 400. The true or false, it is unethical for an engineer to accept a fee for expert witness testimony that is assessed as a percentage of the party's recovery. Bruce Frazier was the first one to put it in there, and he said, what is true? Ah, that always becomes the fun part of uh, that. Uh, here's the key. Engineers may request, propose, or accept professional commissions on a contingent basis, basis only under circumstances in which their professional judgment will not be compromised on that. Or engineers should not request, propose, or accept commissions on a contingent basis under circumstances in which their judgment may be compromised. Many people have uh, grappled with this. There is always that ethical question, yes or no, of that. Uh, Generally, the answer is considered, it is considered acceptable on that. They just have to be uh, made clear that about it overall. A lot of times when we get into litigation, there are a lot of parties involved. There might be a lot of expert witnesses involved. The engineer is just one of several persons. Most cases, litigation, especially in tort uh, liability cases like these, uh, it is everybody is paid on a percentage basis. It just has to be very clear on it. Usually, uh, the Opposing attorneys will make it very clear. They will ask that question, is the person actually being paid a percentage of the overall fee? It's probably better, though, if they get paid a flat fee and that takes away any appearance of inappropriateness overall with that. Next question. Okay, we need to know which one to go to next. Hopefully he'll put it in the box quick. Fill in the blank 100. Fill in the blank for 100. Above all considerations, even over other conflicting ethical principles, an engineer's paramount ethical responsibility is to what? All right, you got Paul on here. Paul Kendazor. And he said, what is public safety? And that is correct. The life safety, life safety, uh, and of the public is the safety, health, and welfare of the public is the primary responsibilities of engineers on that. So that's the big thing on that. So you see that from both societies. So next choice of question. Okay, Paul. Let us know which question you'd like next. What's wrong with that for 400? What's wrong with that for 400? Two major competitors in a region decide that they are wasting too much effort competing on the same work. 
The firms agree to divide up the territory geographically with one firm taking only jobs located in the north and west and the other taking jobs south and east. Laith Stefan, you were the first one in. What is collusion? Ah, very good on that. So yes, that is definitely considered collusion on that. Uh, we had engineers uh, shall build their uh, professional reputation on the merits of the service and shall not compete unfairly with others. Unfortunately, there is a little too much of that um, competing unfairly out there, especially on the small firms on that. Um, engineers shall not knowingly engage in business or professional practices of a fraudulent, dishonest, or unethical nature. And that's the key part here when we get into collusion. It's it's considered fraudulent, dishonest, and unethical. And you see the same parts with the NSP. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration actually takes this very much seriously. The Office of Inspector General actually has a whistleblower phone uh, a hotline for people to report actual fraud on federal aid highway projects as well. And I know it gets called and referred to it. I definitely know a few cases in the past few years where employees, and usually on a contractor side, that may have uh, blown the whistles on fraudulence, but also becomes a big issue when there's collusion during bidding, when two firms agree, I won't touch this, but I'll, I'll do this one, you go after that one, just don't compete against us on those two projects. So uh, that becomes a big issue on that. Okay, hey, Leith, which question would you like next? True or false for 300, please. True or false for 300, a clearly set category. True or false, it is unethical to review another engineer's work without the engineer's knowledge or consent. Terrence Wright, that was the first person. He said, what is true? Yeah, that is generally considered true. Of course, some people argue, what's your definition of review? Um, uh, shall, engineers shall not maliciously or falsely, uh, falsely, directly or indirectly injure the professional reputation, prospects, practice, or employment of another engineer or just indiscriminately criticized on how their engineers work. So generally, when they're talking about this case, the review, just making bold-faced statements about it, just saying they're wrong on that. Uh, but an NSP got very interesting in the choice of words. Engineers in private practice shall not review the work of another engineer for the same client, yeah. except where the knowledge of such engineers are useful or or unless the connection of such engineers with the work has been to, uh, been terminated on it. So uh, generally, you don't want to be reviewing somebody else's works. Like I said, some people did, you know, question what's the word reviewing. Uh, if it's part of a normal engineering review process where you have a senior engineer design or a junior engineer design it and a engineer record reviews it, that's different. And this is where somebody independent is reviewing it and possibly providing criticism on that. So that always becomes the bit of an issue on that. So, uh, of course, they should always, somebody should always know if somebody is reviewing their work as well on that. Okay. Choice of question time. Yep. Where would you like to go? You make the call 500. Who makes the call for 500? An engineer serves as an appointed chair of a county planning board. The engineer is also a principal of a design firm. From time to time, clients who have subcontracted work to the engineer's firm appear before the board. The chair discloses the, inf discloses the information as does not contribute to discussion or cast a vote, but he continues to preside as chair of the meet board meeting. Scott Slack. All right, I got the first part of your answer, what is, but I didn't get the rest of it. So I'll need you to put in what you want the rest of it to be. What is excuse yourself? Yes, and that's generally what's considered the appropriate answer on that. Uh, we had the language from the uh, societies, engineers and public services service as members, advisors, or employees of a governmental body or a department shall not participate in consideration or actions with respect to the service solicitation, solicited or provided by them or their organization in private or public engineering practice. Same language down below on that. For one, like even though they're not participating in the actual discussion or voting, they're leading discu the discussion. And of course, the big question is, who are they actually representing at that point, the town or 
their firm that they work for. So they always have that definitely the appearance of something not quite right on it. And of course, some people might be intimidated by that person still continuing to lead the discussion. Many cases when a person recuses themselves from it, it's best that they also even leave the room so they're not even there. Choice of question time. Scott already put it in. He said, fill in the blank for 300, please. Fill in the blank for 300. If an engineering assignment includes work outside the engineer's field of competence, the engineer must. Darren Owens, if you'll put your answer in the box, please. I'm looking for it to pop up here. He was the first one to respond. What is find someone competent? Find someone competent. Yes, ex excellent on that. Yes, and what we're happening here when we're talking about these things, uh, engineers, we've mentioned before about providing services only in their uh, respective fields on it. So what is expected on it, if somebody hands you the information you're not and you're not qualified to do that type of work, find somebody who is all that. You can always, if you're a junior engineer, work under the supervision of that competent person on it, but ultimately that person is taking charge on it and they're, in a sense, mentoring you through the process. So sometime in the future, you might be that competent person, but at this time, you're not, you need to seek out that additional uh, assistance and for somebody who has that technical knowledge to do it properly on it. So you definitely don't want to be this person who's signed and sealed or stamped the project and something doesn't go right on that. So. And that's a bigger issue in some uh, fields than others. I mean, I've put my seal on uh, plans for a hospital, uh, certain parts connecting a building to a hospital. And these things always, you know, always get a little more, some reason these are a little more frightening than others for some reason on that. So, next category. Just enter it in the question box and I'll read it off. You make the call for 400. You make the call for 400. Engineers abruptly leaves his job to open a private practice. Immediately after leaving, the engineer contacts former clients to advise that the old firm is incapable of providing quality service and is inviting clients to leave with him. Meanwhile, the em employer is, conduct is contacting the same clients, claiming that their former employee was incompetent and dishonest. Mary Hoy, you'll put your answer in the box, please. I'll read it off. Um, what is report? Yes, what is report? And what makes it interesting here is we have both sides doing it. And yes, this has happened because I know somebody uh, who it happened to and I've also heard it from the company. Actually, she didn't say anything. The company said things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the engineer shall act in a professional manner for each employer or client as faithful agents or trustees. So in this case, uh, even though they're a former employee, they're still having to work with their clients. Whether or not the claims are true or not, that becomes unprofessional matter on that. Uh, engineers shall not maliciously or falsely, directly or indirectly injure the professional reputation, prospects, practice, or employment of another engineer or discriminate or indiscriminately criticize another's work. All of that. Uh, similar thing, language with NSP about do not, shall not attempt to even injure um, maliciously or falsely, directly or indirectly to professional reputation, prospects, practice, or employment of other engineers. Uh, so that becomes the issue. Unfortunately, some people, uh, when there is a separation from an employee from a firm, emotions might get in the way on it. If you go back historically, it used to be a bigger issue. I once was looking at some, now you would consider them historic documents uh, for a bridge project. And these were people from the Roebling Company. You know, they're the ones who built the Brooklyn Bridge, but it was not the Brooklyn Bridge. And they basically had uh, two engineers just going back and forth in writing. And it was not what you call very polite language either. Oh, no, but it was out there for everybody to see. Nowadays, we would definitely say there was definitely a character assassination from both parts in that particular discussions on that. Next question. Okay, Mary, where do you want to go next? Who makes the call 200? Who makes the call for 200? 
If an engineer is performing services as a sole proprietor and creates false business expenses and vastly underreports his revenue on his federal income tax, the IRS uncovers the deceit and the engineer is convicted of tax evasion. Gary Heitkamp, he said, what is lose our license? And that is actually very correct on that. A lot of people aren't aware of this. Engineers shall, sh shall act in, in such a matter as to uphold and enhance the honor, integrity, and dignity of the engineering profession and shall act with zero tolerance or bribery. Fraud is the key word here and corruption on that. Of course, engineers should always act honorably, responsibly, ethically, and lawfully on that. In this case, they did not act off, uh, lawfully. They had a, a, a IRS violation by not properly reporting taxes. Those are things that during renewal period that we have to make sure that we uh, fully disclose uh, this. Like I got two renewal forms over here, which I have to uh, deal with for later th this year. And there's that checkbox you know, where you convicted of any fraud and acts or other things in there uh, that you know they don't consider traffic uh, uh, tickets to be one of those issues, but they list what they consider to be unacceptable behavior. And you can definitely lose your license uh, for even for reporting it and definitely will most likely lose it for not reporting it. Next question. All right, if you'll put it in the box. I call that the don't mess with the IRS question. Yeah. <laughs> they even got Al Capone. So, all right, report or not report 200. Report or not report for 200. An ASCE member reads a notice from the state board about an engineer whose license was revoked for practicing outside his or her area of competence. The reader knows that the person named in this notice is also an ASCE member. Benjamin Romine, what is report? And that is uh, usually what the correct answer is for uh, what is to report all that. Uh, and a lot of people also call this the snitch rule on this one. Um, violations and the duty of every society member is to report promptly to the Committee of Professional Conduct any observed violation of society's code of ethics. Uh, in this case, we're getting into society levels on it for both of these societies. If somebody has actually violated the code, then these are being, in these cases, violations that are reported to these individual societies on that. It always becomes a different story with when it comes to state agencies or state licensing boards that definitely becomes a definitely a very interesting question because usually they are notified separately as well on that uh, so but generally the answer will be re to report on that so uh, as well to the state licensing board if there is a known violation on that next question okay let's see which one they put in there next report or not report for 500 to report or not report for 500. The owner or principal of an engineering company discovers that one or more of his employees has paid kickbacks to a public official in exchange for engineering work. Robert Taylor, you were the first one to put something in the box, but all it was was an O, so you're gonna have to, or an OH, I'm sorry. Tell me what your answer is there. Put it back in the box. What is report? Yeah, that is the correct answer is uh, please, uh, do report on it. Engineers shall act with zero tolerance for bribery, fraud, and corruption in all engineering and construction activities for which they are engaged, or they shall not uh, aid or abet an unlawful practice of engineering by a person or firm. That's considered absolute bribery. There have been a lot of people that have been caught up in these schemes because of what's considered acceptable business practice. Many years ago, we're going back into the, in the 70s, uh, there was the whole issues with uh, Vice President Spiro Agnew. What got him was basically the same thing as Al Capone. Uh, he was actually accepting bribes from engineering firms in the Baltimore area uh, and Baltimore County and Pacific. Specifically, even when he became vice president of the United States, he was still requiring these uh, payments to him. I think it was about 10% of the fees uh, were uh, given to him and those firms would get uh, money. That was how you did business in Baltimore on that. But a lot of engineering firms got in trouble with it, even though it was considered practice. A lot of engineers lost their license over that as well on that. So it becomes definitely a big issue and that's always becomes the issue of the, what's considered acceptable practice in one place is definitely not acceptable practice elsewhere. 
or it may even violate the law. Getting close to the end, one, uh, probably two more questions. Okay. Waiting for our question. Please give us our, the question you'd like to ask next. Fill in the blank for 200. Fill in the blank for 200. An engineer whose professional judgment is overruled in a situation where the public health, safety, or welfare is endangered shall. Denise Taylor. You have to put in the answer. What is report? Yeah, it is definitely a report of that. This becomes an issue on that engineers whose professional judgment is overruled under circumstances where the safety, health, and welfare of the public are endangered shall inform the clients or employers of their possible consequences on that or shall notify their employer or client of such authority on that. This was a big issue when we had this space uh, shuttle Challenger accident uh, disaster several years ago back in the 80s. Uh, the engineers at Morton Thiokol were pro uh, providing what the problem was that they should not launch people in the public relations side of things and at NASA uh, overruled the judgment and the recommendations of the engineers and went ahead with the launch and unfortunately we know what happened with that overall uh, with that. So, uh, Probably the last question then. Okay, Denise, you get to fill in for 400. Fill in the blank for 400 to clear this category. An engineer is looking to boost her retirement savings by taking separate work outside of her regular employment. The work does not compete with her employer and it will all be done in her off hours. She should. Steven Solinsky. You'll have to put your answer in the box, Stephen, because all I got was a we. As soon as he puts it in there, I'll read it off. What is do it? That's what he put in. Okay, that's, uh, that always becomes a gray area. What do they do on that? Well, let's go through the statements and see what many places have actually has their policies on it. The engineers shall not accept professional employment outside of their regular work or interest without the knowledge of their employers. And that's the key part there, uh, that they do need to do, have the knowledge of those particular things. When I was a regional governor of ASCE, as well as with the, uh, the boards, because uh, my travel was reimbursed and it was, cons it was basically about $3,500 a year of reimbursement on that. Uh, that was disclosed. I actually had to fill out ethics form. Similarly, because I, I work in a position that has partially funded by the Federal Highway Administration, there was paperwork filed with the United States Department of Transportation saying that I had that item. So therefore, even though I was able to provide lobbying knowledge to certain aspects, I was not allowed to for transportation related items on that. So both sides, information was disclosed on that on it and it kept me from doing certain things as well on uh, it. So same thing with NSP, notify their employers on it. They have to know about that conflict. A lot of people have other things outside. I remember some people I used to work with, they had a, a gift basket business completely unrelated to engineering. So on that, but still had to be disclosed on that. And you know what's amazing, Ted, is here in Ohio, if you work for the DOT, uh, they do require disclosure of any secondary employment. Yep. We all learned about that in the like state of Ohio ethics class that we take. Yeah, so. and that's common practice everywhere. On it. it's like every year I have to fill out ethics forms. Uh, that uh, it's like this year. Yeah, like actually, it's, I'm sure they're going to question my next one because all those conflicts are gone for the next uh, upcoming fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So they're going to go, how, go, how did you go from something to nothing all of a sudden? Thing. So I, know how, I have to be prepared for that one mm -hmm. overall with that change on it. But I've known people who've gone actually to prison for over this particular situation as well. Uh, that So they didn't disclose something with their employer uh, and you know went into the federal court system on that. So, well, that is it for our game of Jeopardy. It just kind of covered just last 
two slides. Just remember the decision flow chart. First thing is look, make sure is what are you doing legal? Go through, does it satisfy code of conduct? Uh, make sure you take into account all the stakeholders. Or do you have any conflicts? And how will it be perceived by the public is the last part of the test on that. If it doesn't pass that, it probably will be considered unethical on that. When you're promoting your roles in promoting your role in uh, ethics overall, we make sure you have good policies in there and review them, uh, the applicable codes and ethics and policies as well as they do change with time as well. Make sure you have a full understanding of the law that best that you can and what is your legal obligations. And universally, what are the general requirements to understand what is considered the right thing to do on that? When in doubt, always ask somebody uh, that is in a position to have a full understanding of this as well. And always ask yourself, what would I do on it? Is this a good thing or not? On that. And I like to, oh, and just to help others to, uh, well, this is the reason why I do it, to help create a good corporate culture or uh, agency culture, define your organization's value, communicate what those values are, what good are the values if nobody knows about it, ultimately demand compliance, reward compliance, and penalize non-compliance with that as well. I'd like to thank everybody for playing with the game of uh, engineering ethics. Hopefully you got some good information out of this. A lot of people seem to be quite involved with this topic and we're having good answers as well. So I'd like to thank everybody for uh, their time and participating. And look, hopefully you do well in your uh, engineering f futures as well. Thanks, Ted. We really appreciate your time and all the effort that went into putting this together for us. Um, your certificates, everyone, will be coming out in the next few days. We have one intern on staff who does all the certificates and we maxed the webinar today with 500 people so give her a couple days to get those out to you please um, also let your colleagues who didn't get in know that we're going to schedule a replay of the webinar for them since they missed the event um, we were amazed at the response we got to the enrollment for this so ted thank you so much we really appreciate it and You're welcome we everybody to stay safe. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.